first want to say thank you to the incredible praise team that we have. That you've, you, They use your gifts every week to serve the Lord. Um, thank you for leading us. Um, Brad Pray, but what you might not know is our redemptive arts pastor, Pastor Dan, who usually leads us, they had their second child this past week. And so he's there with Harvey. We call him baby Harvey. And Harvey, if you're watching online, it feels like all of our kids are born with Facebook in their hands now. Just know we're praying for you uh, at, at a week old. And so if, if Dan and Melissa, if you guys are watching, man, we love you guys and can't wait to see you soon. And for everyone else who's watching, traveling, can't wait to have you guys with us shortly. So my name is Josh Burnham, lead pastor here at Bethel. And we've been journeying through the book of Acts. And some of you who know me well, you know that I get sad when we finish like, certain books. Because it might be 20 years before we ever go through Acts again. And so today is the culmination of what we have called the model church. Looking at the Acts of the Apostles and asking the Lord to stir our hearts to change us and to challenge us as we encounter the living and active word of God. We know that the spirit of God works through his word in our lives. So if you have your Bibles with you today, Acts chapter 28, really go and Acts until you can't go anymore. Acts 28, beginning in verse 23, and we will read to the end. I wanna share a story with you, doctor's report. The heavy onslaught of music is threatening the hearing of this current generation. So some doctors estimate that one billion youth are in danger of losing their hearing. They're actually calling this generation the deaf generation. Um, in particular, one ENT specialist says this. Dr. Cherukuri says that the largest cause of hearing damage is millennials using iPods and smartphones. And he says this, and I thought this just was hilarious. You once had a Walkman with two AA batteries. Anyone want to admit that was you? Okay. And headphones that went over your ears, and the sound was so distorted that you couldn't hear what they were saying anyway. But he said, now we have smartphones at our disposal and the music is so crystal clear that it is permanently damaging our hearing. I remember in high school saving up $200 for a Sony Discman that would not skip. Now you guys don't realize how cool I really was, but let me tell you. So it had a leather case and a strap and you strapped it on your hands. So you could run like with a Frisbee in your hand, but it would not ever skip. So I could put in the cutting edge Christian music of that day and I could listen to it crystal clear. But now we have our phones and we have hundreds, if not thousands and millions of songs at our disposal. And doctors say that this is destroying our hearing. And he says that sound that is too loud or played too long can permanently damage your ears. I began to think about that in spiritual terms. And I truly believe that if we're not careful, we can damage our spiritual ears with too much loudness of church, of the institutional church, too much loudness of Christian culture or whatever it might be. And so I think we need to pump the brakes and say, Lord, what are we doing that might cause us or hinder us from hearing you? Because if we're honest, maybe we have permanent hearing damage because people tell us how we should read the word of God. They've told us how we should listen to the spirit of God. And so we listen to other people about how we should listen to God rather than listening to the Lord. You see, we see a specific group of people that have that exact mentality in Acts chapter 28. So let's read about these people in the book of Acts. Because I believe that we, you, I have a lot of similarities with this group. And that we should pray, Lord, open our ears to hear your holy, righteous word in your spirit. Acts chapter 28, beginning in verse 23. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament, and then Acts. 
Verse 23, last chapter, after arranging a day with him, many came to him at his lodging, that's Paul. From dawn to dusk, he expounded and testified about the kingdom of God. He tried to persuade them about Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. Some were persuaded by what he said, but others did not believe. Disagreeing among themselves, they began to leave after Paul made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah, which he spoke. So hearing loss is not a modern 2019 phenomenon. Yes, it is a problem here. But Paul, 2,000 years ago, is speaking to a people who have hearing loss, who is now referring back to Isaiah 700 years prior has hearing loss. So we live in cultures that are deaf to God. This is what Isaiah says. This is what Paul says. Go to these people and say, You will always be listening, but never understanding. You will always be looking, but never perceiving. For the hearts of these people have grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing. They have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with with their heart and turn. And if they turn, God promises, I will Heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Now, let me say we're going to come back to this verse. This does not mean that God has forsaken his people, the Jews. This just means that the mission is continuing. So the Jews first, then the Gentiles. Verse 30, Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house. And he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Today's message is simply called a life without hindrance. Let's pray. Father, we confess to you right now that often we are tone deaf. Lord, we sit in our pews and we have Bibles on our shelves, but we truly don't know what you sound like. So help us right now hear your word by your spirit. Help us drown out the noise of the things that compete with our attentions and with our affections. Remove the distractions that we might know one thing that is Christ and him crucified. Lord, help us live lives without hindrance, with boldness, standing upon the promises of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you are honest, what keeps you from pursuing God? Don't say that out loud. But if you were really honest What keeps you from pursuing Christ? Because what keeps a 16-year-old from pursuing Christ might be different than what keeps a 86-year-old from pursuing Christ. And here's the beauty of the church that you're worshiping in today. We have 16-year-olds and we have 86-year-olds worshiping. We have a couple in this church. I asked them again, I said, how long have you guys been married? They said, 67 years. They're not 67 years old. They've been married faithfully. And I said, what a wonderful church that we can gather in and we have that experience here in this place. But if we're all honest, there's something that strives for our attention to know Christ and to make him known. And so this is where I want us to begin right now. If we're honest, and so what you've probably had in your mind was external, Hey, I have financial difficulties. I'm having relational difficulties. Did you know that my kids threw a fit and, and like legion jumped into my kids this morning and possessed them? We get it. But the greatest threat to you pursuing Christ is not here. The greatest threat is right here. We're not gonna sing the Star Spangled Banner, but go ahead and put your hand over your heart. I want you to feel the weight. 
Look, it's not, it's not their fault that you're not pursuing Christ. It's not your fault that I'm not pursuing Christ with everything I have. You know whose fault it is? It's right here. This thing that we call a heart. And I pray that God would change our hearts. Look at what the word says. Verse 27, we're gonna camp out right here in this verse. For the hearts of the people have grown callous. Some of your versions say dull. Some of you have a word that says calloused. You see, these are people who will always be hearing, but never understanding. Always seeing, but never perceiving. And how often do we find ourselves right here in this scripture? I, I, I often go to the Lord and say, God, you showed me this a thousand times, but Lord, just one more. God, I've heard this a million times, but just one more. And I believe God is saying, Josh, we, we go to the Lord and we say, God, I can't see. He says, open your eyes, open your heart to my goodness. So I want to give you three symptoms of, an un, of a hindered heart this morning. And then I want to give us three evidences of a unhindered gospel-centered life. So if you're counting, that's probably six points, but we'll get through it. So three symptoms of a hindered life. And it camps out here in verse 27. The hearts of these people have grown callous. Dr. Luke is writing the book of Acts. He knows about hearts and he writes this word. It's specifically called epakunte. And it's a word that means dull. It's a word that means callous. People who have this heart. Specifically, it can mean dull. It can mean to fatten. It can mean to be gross. And it can mean to be unfeeling. So the three symptoms this morning of a hindered, distracted heart are dull hearts, fatty hearts, gross hearts, and unfeeling hearts. You say, well, there's three. You just gave me four. Dull is the same as fatty. Let's look at the fatty heart. What would that fat heart look like? This is the condition that lurks inside of each of us. This, this fattened heart is written to people who know the Lord. Isaiah is writing to Israel, the what? The covenant people of the Lord. The one who by Abraham, God said, I will not call you of father. I will call you of Rahim, father of many, because your people will be my, penny, my people. Look in the stars. Look how many stars. Count them. You can't count them. There's gonna be more people than that. If the Lord had told me, and my wife, look in the stars, you're going to have that many kids. Lord, I'm out. <laughs> my neighbor would love that. But that's the blessing of the Lord. These are the people that God is speaking to. So don't think of some people from a far off land that have never heard the name of the one true God. These are his people. And if you have grown up in church... And you say, well, I don't remember the first time I heard the name of Jesus. I've always been his. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. People that could have fatty hearts. You see, fatty spiritual heart is the one who is puffed up with knowledge. You're sitting in my seat. Say what? You don't realize that I've sat in that seat for 20 years. But now you do realize it. So will you please remove yourself from my seat? Because I can only hear God in my seat. And heaven forbid you hear God in my seat. And is that not trite and trivial? But how many times do we become puffed up? Because of who we think we are. Because we've added and added and added. And our hearts are fatty or greasy. Oh, that we would not have this heart. In Acts, Paul uses a quote from Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. Why do I rem remind you of that? Because what's happening in Isaiah chapter 6? Isaiah sees this heavenly vision. Right? Behold, I see the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am 
undone. And I have a a dirty mouth and I come from people with unclean lips. And the Lord sends a cherub from the heavens and he grabs a coal from the tabernacle and he takes it and he cleanses Isaiah's mouth and he gives him a royal charge. And Isaiah says, Lord, God says, "Who, who will go for me? And he says, here I am, send me. And this is the commission for Isaiah, this verse. Go to the people. Isaiah has seen this vision. He has a clean mouth. He has this new charge, this new zeal. And God says, go to this people. They're gonna be awesome. They're always gonna hear, but you know what? They're never gonna understand. They're always gonna see, but they're never gonna perceive. Isaiah, they have fatty hearts. They know a lot about me, but they don't know me. God wants us to have hearts that know him. Moshe Rosen, the founder of the Jews for Jesus, says today that the Jews are among the most gospel resistant people in the world. Always hearing. Does that mean that God has forgotten his people? No, there's always going to be a remnant. God is still working in his covenant community. But often the people who are most close to the Lord can become the most callous to his work. That should resonate with us. That we would not have fatty, greasy hearts. But we're beyond that, aren't we? We're not in Isaiah's day. We're not Pharisees. And I'm not even a Sadducee. We're beyond this symptom. Or are we? How often do we drink from the religious well of abundance? How often? I know this is an old reference now. How often did we, did we wear our WWJD bracelets and truly care less about what Jesus wanted? How often do we listen to our Christmas, our Christmas and Christian music as we scream vulgarities from the car? How dare you cut me off? And then we get our praise back on. How often do we find our Bibles on every shelf and yet grow weary in worship and tired when we pray? Fatty hearts is a symptom of a hindered life. But there's another condition, not just greasy, fatty hearts that are too puffed up or enlarged, but hearts that are simply gross. The word calloused can mean gross. Now, what do I mean by gross? It's not necessarily the face you make when you eat Brussels sprouts. You're like, which we love Brussels sprouts put a little balsamic vinegar on them, broil them for about 20 minutes. Mm, like little cabbages. Don't come eat at our house if you don't like Brussels sprouts. So what do we mean by gross hearts? Grossness is being unrefined, bitter, unpleasant, and very rude. I like to call this the social media heart, right? Something about social media tempts us to join in to join in trollish behavior. There's something about social media that says, you know what, you have a voice and everyone wants to hear you. That's not true. So we become gross. We can become outraged. I believe the world looks at the church sometimes and they just see angry people. Why are you so mad, brah? I mean, look at your life. Sometimes we just act like we're mad about everything. They took prayer out of schools. We, we can't pray. You can't pray? I can't pray because someone passed a law. Don't tell that to Daniel when you get to heaven. Because he's going to say, you know what? I had lions and I had my Lord. And I chose my Lord. And the lions bowed down. 
Oh, that we would not have these bitter hearts. These hearts that, that say, God, it's all about me. The fatty heart says, it's about me. The gross heart says, I don't care about you. Ever been there? You know what? I, 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 want, I love the Lord, but mm, I don't love you. Or have you maybe said, you know, God says I have to love you, but he never said I have to like you. I'm so glad that that's not God's stance towards me. Because I have given him a million reasons plus one not to like me, not to love me, to be bitter and angry. And God chooses otherwise. See, it was the gross callousness of the priest and the Levite who when they saw the man beaten on the side of the road, they were walking up and they, they, were, they were going to church. Let that sink in. They were going to church. And they see a man in need, beaten, bruised, dying, could be dying. And the priest said, mm, well, some, I'm sure someone's coming behind me, so let me just... Let me just walk. And the Levite said, well, I'm also in her. Let me just, let me just kind of bypass a gross heart, unrefined heart that says, I don't really care about you right now. I, I can't care about you right now as much as I can care about me. And it was, thank goodness for the Samaritan that said, I'll drop everything. And nothing's more important than, than your health. And I'm going to take you to the doctor and I'm going to pay your medical bills. My goodness, how much would that cost today? You see, the gross heart is a heart that is hindered. It's a heart that is hindered from seeking Christ. The third type of heart is this. Yes, we have the gross heart. And yes, we have the fatty heart, but we also have the unfeeling heart. This is the heart that is dull. This is the heart that says, I've been through so much in my life. It is easier for me not to feel anything. It's the heart that has no warmth, even though it's been through the fire. Isn't that what normally happens to us? I've been burned three or four times, and so I, I'm just not going to have any warmth because of what has happened to me. And if we're not careful, if we do that, we lose our warmth towards Christ, don't we? If we cut off all feeling, then that's when we sit in church and we sing songs that should stir our hearts. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. But, but I don't wanna feel it. God, I'll sing it with my mouth, but don't let it change my heart. Heaven forbid I feel God's mercy here. Heaven forbid someone look at me and think that I, God is stirring up a fire within me. Remember what Paul, the same Paul that's in jail right now here, what he tells Timothy? He says, fan into flame the spirit that is within you. Fan that cold fire until you burn with rejoicing over Christ. See, the, the heart that doesn't want to fill is the heart that's hindered. And the longer we live, the more callous we can become, isn't it? That's what, that's what a callous is, right? A callous on your skin. I'm not a medical professional. I, I don't, don't send me emails after this, okay? But a callous is a place on your hands, that tent, that have pressure. And over time, the more pressure and the more use they become, the more hard that part becomes. And so the more pressure, the more tension, the more stress, the more the callus grows for protection. And if we're not careful, we want to protect ourselves so much that we don't feel anything. The world is dying for Christians to love and to care. These are three symptoms of hearts that hinder us from Christ. The fatty heart, the heart that is puffed up with knowledge. 
the gross heart, the heart that is unrefined. If you're on your phone right now, put it down. It's not worth it. Quit being angry all the time. Or the heart that just says, I, I've had enough. I don't want to feel anything. I'm just going to go through the motions until the Lord takes me home. Praise Christ that the antidote to our hard hearts is found in Ezekiel. God says that I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. So if I am in Christ, I have no excuse to have this same heart. Now we must have a different heart. And so let's look at Paul. We've looked at verse 27. Now let's look at what Paul says that was going to happen to people who love him and pursue. Some of you are greasy this morning. Some of you are gross this morning. Some of you are unfeeling this morning. And by the time we leave, I pray that we're different. Verse 28, Paul says, Let it be known to you that salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will Listen, so the answer to our deaf tone hearts is hearing the Spirit of God. The answer to our deaf generation is the Spirit of the Lord, this new heart. And so the book of Acts ends right where we're going to end today. Look at the final verse, verse 31. Paul is in Key West, deep sea fishing. He is in jail for two years. So keep that in mind when we read this. He's in jail and he is proclaiming the kingdom of God, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This book of Acts ends with this one word in the Greek. It's in New Testament, it's called a hapax, H-A-P-A-X, hapax legomenon, but hapax means only used once. So Dr. Luke ends this book with one word that is only used one time in all of Scripture. And most striking about this word, unhindered, it's the same word that Josephus uses of someone who is not hindered by Caesar to perform their normal customary rites as a Jew. Now we can't go into all this right now, but where is Paul going to? He's journeying around Asia and now he's jumping. He wants to go to Rome. And in Rome, there's a man who wears the, the fern thing around his head. Caesar, right? He's appealing to Caesar. He's appealing to this highest man. And Luke is using a word that means that he's not hindered by Caesar. So how can we live unhindered lives? How can a man who is in jail strapped to a guard, can you imagine that guard hearing about Christ every day over and over and over and over again? How is this man unhindered for Christ? So you see, if we can see anything in Acts, if anyone lived an abundant, unhindered, spirit-filled life, it was Paul. Shipwrecked, yes. Viper bites, yes. Beaten, yes. Imprisoned, yes. And Paul is living this unhindered life. And so throughout Acts, the triumph was never with the bearer of the gospel. The triumph was always through the person. Does that make sense? So I, I don't want to, I don't want to, subvertly make you think, well, if I just come to Christ and I'll be free from this prison I'm in. No, this book has a horrible Hollywood ending. Hey, Acts ends and Paul is still in, he's in prison. He's, he's not removed from prison. So I don't want you to think if I come to Christ, all the chains are gonna fall off. Everything's gonna be rosy. No, Paul would say, you don't understand. The power is not from me. The power is through me, the power is of Christ. We hold this treasure in jars of clay so that the all surpassing glory of Christ would not be from me, but it's from Jesus Christ. That is what Paul proclaims to us right now. So what are the three evidences of a, an unhindered life? Well, very simply, God does not want us to be fatty, but hungry. God does not want us to be fatty, but
but hungry. What do I mean by that? The fattened heart says, I've had enough. I've had enough religion. Oh, that's good. I've had enough Bible. Look at me. I have had enough morality. Look at the boxes I check. I've never smoked. I've never danced. I only watch certain movies. I've never watched anything else. So I am content with this. I have had all that I need. I've had enough institutional church. But Jesus tells us differently, does he not? In the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. Now he does not say that so that we will be fatty. He doesn't say blessed are those who are greasy. Because the religion is oozing out of our pores. He says, no, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because you will be filled. I think of it like this. Have you ever been really thirsty? It may be in your mind when you're, when you're extremely thirsty, you only want certain drinks. Maybe for you it's water. Um, for me, it's, I either want a white Powerade. I don't even know the flavor. I just know it's white. Or a Coca-Cola Classic, preferably in a bottle. And I, and I like it with enough carbonation that when I take that first sip, I have, like it, it almost bites. But when I have that first drink, I don't put it down and say, mm, that was enough. Fully satisfied. You know what I do? I say, I want more. So Jesus says, the more I hunger and thirst for righteousness, the more that he will fill me and I will be filled. And then the more I can hunger and thirst. The unhindered life is the hungry life. Maybe you have walked with Christ for 80 years. You don't know everything you need to know yet. You're not exactly where God wants you to be yet. Continue to hunger, to continue to thirst for righteousness. That's what we should look like. We should look like people who are hungering and thirsting thirsty that we can say God I want more that we can say ah, but God I want so much more I can't get enough of your presence Lord I, I want you in my life let's feast but not grow fat that's the unhindered life blessed are those who hunger and thirst and Paul is in jail and I can just see him wanting more Wanting more of the Holy Spirit working in his life. He's flagging people in near his jail cell. Hey, come on in. You, I have plenty of time. Come hear about the word of the Lord. Let me tell you why I can't get enough of this Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done in my life. I know I'm in chains and I know I might die in these chains, but I want to tell you about true freedom that you can't see. Because I am hungry. I am feasting, but I am not fatty. The second evidence we need to have in our life is not gross, but gentle and unusually kind. I already told you about the calluses, right? Maybe you play guitar, the calluses that built up over time where you can't feel what you need to feel to protect you. Well, it's interesting in this last chapter of Acts, Paul has run into a group of people on the island of Malta. And in verse Two, we see this about these people. They weren't gross, but they were gentle. The word of God says about this group that they, the local people showed us extraordinary kindness. Extraordinary kindness. Did you catch that? For the rest of eternity, these people will be known as extraordinary and kind. Not calloused, not gross, not angry, not vitriolic, but people who were kind, who were loving. Can you imagine what the church would look like if The world said, we don't understand this God that you worship. We don't understand this Jesus, that God would send his only son to die on the cross. And this, this son of God would 
raise again in three days and now ascend into heaven. We don't understand it, but one thing we realize, it has radically changed your life and you are extraordinarily kind. What would happen if the people of God changed the dynamic from angry religious people to extraordinarily kind? What would we look like then? This is the evidence of a gentle spirit. The unhindered life. And you say, well, I, I put these hurdles in my life because you don't understand who's hurt me. And so I'm gonna put barriers and hurdles and a moat with alligators and sharks and they will never do that again because if, I, if I'm gentle, I'll be taken advantage of. Yes. True. But how much so when we worship a Messiah that as a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth, who modeled gentleness and kindness. Oh, that we would be like this. The word used of the people of Malta is philanthropion. Someone who is extraordinarily generous. We call them philanthropic. This philos, this love of brotherly love of anthropon of others. Church, we need to get back to the basics. We need to be gentle and loving towards others. Not fatty, but feasting. Not gross, but gentle. And lastly, the unhindered life. Not calloused, but convicted. The unhindered life feels deeply and is convicted about the right things. The right things. Oftentimes we are convicted about the wrong things. And the world looks at us and we say, y'all don't even know what you believe, but the things that you do believe, we're not sure that scripture teaches that. And the things that you're angry about, we don't know if that's what God desires in your life. We need to stand upon the word of the Lord. We need to champion the right to life. of saying that all men are created in the image of God. Those born and those yet born. There is only one race, but there is multiple ethnicities and all men are created in that image. That's something that we should get behind. Oh, that we see people in need and we are the first to run to them and to pick them up and to bandage their wounds and to help those in need. That's something that we should be convicted, that the word of God is living and active and true and is our authority. That is something that we should stand upon. We need to be convicted about the things that God is convicted about. We need to be convicted that Jesus is the way that he is the truth, that he is the life. We need to quit looking at a world that is dying and going to destruction away from God and saying, look, Jesus is the hope. Instead of sitting back with apathy and saying, good luck, hope you figure it out. We need convicted hearts. Paul proclaims the kingdom of God, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Just simply, I, I, I want us to close on this thought. For those of you who like to watch movies, if this were a movie, it would have a horrible ending. It doesn't really end. Paul is proclaiming Jesus and he's done. Why would God's word want us to end there? Because he wants to, you to understand that the Spirit of God does not end in Acts. That this message of redemption and the hope for the nations continues. And it continues in 2019 in July in St. Clair County. When the people of God gather around the word of God, the power of God and the spirit of God, this story, the proclamation of the kingdom without hindrance continues. It's as if the acts of the apostles is still being written in your life today. 
That's what God wants us to know. Another story that did not have a Hollywood ending is a man named Walter McMillan. Some of you might recognize this story. In 1986, this man was convicted of killing an 18-year-old girl at a dry cleaner in Monroeville, Alabama. Despite witnesses testifying that he was at a fish fry at his church, because of the outrage, he was immediately sentenced and immediately convicted and immediately sentenced. Well, many people realize, though, this was a false conviction. And so a man named Brian Stevenson decided to defend Mr. McMillan. And after six years on death row, he was freed and able to leave and live a life of hope and joy. But the story does not end on a happy note. This is what the attorney Stevenson said. He said, Mr. McMillan, McMillan lived with the scars of being on death row. One of those scars was early onset dementia. And the doctors believed that his dementia was caused by the trauma of being nearly executed six different times. So bad was the trauma that he was a prisoner in his mind when attorney Stevenson would visit him in the hospital. McMillan was still telling his lawyer, you've got to get me off death row. You've got to get me off death row. He was freed, he was declared innocent and yet he was still a prisoner in his mind. And I believe that many of us still live as a prisoner of our shame, the scars of our sins and the guilt that we bear. Yeah. We read things like feast on, the, on Christ, but don't grow fatty. And, and you, you're feeling guilty because you know you've grown up in church and you've, there are times in your life where you were arrogant and pompous and you yielded the, the Bible as a hammer and not as a sword. You feel guilty and you just feel like the chains of that guilt are weighing on you. I want you to know that God can free you from that. That Jesus died to release you from that prison, to give you hope and to give you a future. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you're trying to figure out how could a man, Paul, who was in prison Declare that he had freedom in Jesus Christ. And I can't fully explain it to you right now, but I just want to say that's the power of the Messiah. That when you come to Jesus Christ, everything that, that weighs you down and so easily hinders you, Jesus says, I'm glad you brought that here. I'll take it. I'll walk in abundance of life. Walk free. Don't walk with these chains. Don't walk with this heaviness. Go. That is what God wants for his people. You've never put your trust in Jesus Christ. You can pray a prayer like this today. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've fallen short. And God, I today believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he rose again. I believe that if I put my hope and trust in him, you will forgive me and you will make me right before you. And God, I declare with my mouth that you are my Lord and I will live every day with you. You know what the Bible says if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Is that you will be saved. Think about that, that we can have salvation. And if you're here right now, if you've prayed that prayer, if you need to, I pray that you would get your heart right with Christ. Maybe you're here and you are wearing chains. Maybe you're the fatty heart. Maybe you're the gross heart. Maybe the heart you say, I'm not gonna feel anything you just said. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Would you open up your heart to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? It is worth it. Oh, that we would feast and not grow fat. Lord, make us hungry. Oh, that we would be gentle and not gross. God, give us kindness. Oh, that we would be convicted and not calloused. Oh, we, the people of God, may we respond to his word in a way that would bring him glory and build our faith. 
Let's pray. Father.